kept track yet of Marquee TV. We've got a really special guest with us today. It's uh, Dave Powell, owner and winemaker of Torbreck Vineyards in Australia. Uh, Torbreck is one of the icon wines out of Australia that still seems to be doing fairly well. Um, Dave has been known to hold no punches, and this is going to be a beautiful interview and a great tasting. Before we start the tasting, I'm going to just ask Dave a quick question. Australian wine industry has been basically kicked in the nuts over the last couple of years, or last year. Um, proliferation of big brands and kind of dilution of the market. Unfortunately, wines like this have been painted with that same uh, broad brush stroke, which is unfair because I've had some Australian wines back from the 60s and 50s and they age gracefully. These wines, I think, are of that ilk and will age 10, 20, 30 years. Dave, just a couple words before we get into tasting about sort of what's happened in Australia in general, sure. where do you find yourself sitting in the, in the market? Um, a few words difficult. I think the Australian wine industry um, has basically got itself into trouble. The Australian wine industry, I think, is trying to be all things to all people and uh, probably focus too much on the lower end of the industry rather than trying to portray ourselves as being a fine wine producer. In fact, I've got myself uh, a lot of trouble at home because I actually don't associate very closely with the Australian industry. I consider that I make world-class wines and uh, they happen to be Australian, very Australian, but I still think that the Australian industry has worked too much on the low end, looked too much for volume, and unfortunately what's happened is um, a lot of people now in North America, as has happened in the United Kingdom now, see us as being a, a producer of cheap and cheerful wines rather than being a producer of world-class wines. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, I think uh, the UK has been a big responsibility of that. And the producers there too, because there's a two-for-one, a three-for-one in Australia, and as a result, it just, it just brought the whole industry down. Well, the sad thing is we've done the same thing in North America as we did in the United, in the United Kingdom. Yeah. You know, it got to the stage where the Australian Wine and Branding Corporation did a great job of convincing people in the UK that the wine should be five pounds in Tesco's. We've done the same things with Yellowtail and Little Penguin and all the crap over here. So. Well, um, fortunately, you know, we try to bring in non-commodity wines, you know, wines of character, wines of flavor. So we, I poured the 2006 Juveniles. Thank you. So, um, do you want to explain it to our uh, viewers? Sure. This is um, actually wine. It's a blend of 60% Grenache, 20% Shiraz, and 20% what we call Mataro. Veg is the uh, name that's most commonly known by it. In fact, its uh, original name, if you like, is Monastro. It was a Spanish variety originally. This wine's interesting. I first made this wine for a very dear friend of mine, a guy called Tim Johnson, who owns a very famous wine bar called um, Juvenile on the, on the Rue de Richelieu in Paris. And he asked me to make a wine for him that was to follow a unwooded Grenache based cuvee that had been made out of the Cote de Rome. So, what I did is I took um, equal components out of all the wines that go into my wooded Grenache based wine called the Steady. Before the wines um, went into barrel, I put them into tank, let the wine naturally go through malolactic fermentation, stabilise it, and bottle it. So, it's purely um, unoaked. The interesting thing about it, and what surprised most people on the name to a certain extent, it becomes a bit of a misnomer, is <coughs> initially it was all made for the wine bar in Paris. In fact, there's nothing juvenile about it. The youngest vineyard in the 06 is 48 years old. The oldest one's 156 years old. The average wine age is about 88 years. And the average yield is a tonne and a half the acre, or 22 hectolitres per hectare. So if you're talking about Bourbon, you'd be talking about Grand Cru Vineyard. Exactly. And what is this retail? I forget what this retails for here. I'm uh, Thirty-two dollars. Thirty-two bucks for something yeah. that's got you know average 80-year-old wines. Yeah. This is re really, really good. Great thing. Sorry, Sorry, it's under Stelvin, so it needs a little bit yeah. of time to open up. Yeah, yeah. The great thing about it, um, because it's never been an oak, there's a lot of pure fruit. So lots of dark cherries and spice, very vibrant Grenache varietal characters. The wine almost has a sweetness on the palate. It's fermented completely bone dry, so there's no sugar. But because it's never had the obscurity of being an oak for um, time, and well, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what tends to happen when you have wines in oak is obviously you get a little bit of oak tannin, you also get that maturation character of that gentle oxidative process of the wine being in wood. This has never happened, so this wine is in a very pure state. And this will this will go for a long time because when you I, ironically, people think because it's unwooded at my age. In fact, this age is better and longer than the wooded version. Well, if you look at Chateauneuf de Pape, some of the great Chateauneufs have been aged in cement tanks. Absolutely. So Absolutely. maybe not as pleasant to drink in the short term, but any good restaurant in France always has a cellar. Oh, absolutely. Put some wines in the cellar three, four, five years, 
and they'll serve their customers something else. So yeah. this falls in the same same line. Well, it does. Apart, other than the fact that we're lucky, because uh, nothing. I'm a huge fan of Shadow to Pup. Anybody that knows me knows that's sort of my you know spiritual home. But I, um, you know, the, because the Australian fruit, fruit profile is so profound that we don't have that problem as the wines when they're young. They'll still age. They have incredible tannin structure because of the age of the vineyards and the the, the yield. And that's the thing with Grenache based wines. The secret to make great Grenache is all vineyards with low yield. It's as simple as that. Simple. It's great. Love this stuff. Reminds me of, uh, well, one foot in Australia, one foot in the Rhone Valley. That's exactly what Steve's trying to well, do. Well, that's what, uh, you know, one of the better known wine critics in North America once described me as being a winemaker that has one foot in the Southern Hemisphere and one foot in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, unfortunately, I thought about it too much one day and realised that meant my testicles were actually hanging over the equator, which made me feel a bit uncomfortable, but apart from that. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> that would be mighty uncomfortable. Yeah. We're going to go, see, excuse me, we're going to go taste... We're going to taste the... I'm sorry, uh, was I supposed to spit that out? Oh, I'm, you know what? I'm not going to spit that out. We're tasting the 2007 Woodcutters. You know, the interesting thing about uh, South Australia and the Barossa Valleys, we've never had phylloxera. So none of my vineyards are planted on rootstock, they're all on vinifera. The Woodcutter Shiraz, it's our bread and butter wine, it's over half our production. What we've effectively done is taken cuttings off all the old Shiraz vineyards that go into our other wines and basically plant the young vineyards right next door. We take a cutting as you would in your garden in springtime, plant it out in the fresh ground, full bud cutting, off it goes. And that's it. That's all we have to do. It's a very easy. This wine comes from 30 different sites. As I said, it's basically all the vineyards that are represented in our older wines and higher end wines that are in this. Um, the, the vineyards are still yielding about two and a half tonne of the acres, so you still, this, that's high for us. Yeah. So you consider even for our entry point wine, we're talking about pretty low yields. Um, the wine spends 12 months a night, put it on food, it'd be four and a half thousand litre. Classic, classic, classic stuff like you find in August Club. At, well, funnily enough, five days ago I was with Pierre Marie. I've just come, I've spent a, just, I've just spent a week in the Rhone. I just flew in on <sighs> He's a Paris great guy, he's a great guy. Well, August wasn't here, but Pierre Marie and I know Pierre Olivier, Marie. He's, well, yeah. I was with Olivia and Pierre Marie. Okay. Okay. Oh, they're good friends of mine, so. <clears> I was here nice. only, yeah. And funny thing is, they, they, Oliver was just saying that they actually have two new Vets. I've just bought two new ones. The first new thing I've seen turn up in that winery in 15 years. I was there uh, four years ago, Pierre Murray was telling me that he had to buy a new vat, and it was like a baby had died yeah, yeah. replacing that old yeah. vat with a new one. Yeah, so he's yeah. got another one. I mean, it, it, must, be kept, it yeah. must be kept. Well, it's, the rest of the place hasn't changed. It's still the same dog works and miles. It's pretty, so yeah. This thing's pretty great. Great stuff. So, this is a, you know, the nice thing about having to spend the 12 months in the wood is it softens the wine, rounds it out, knocks off the rough edges. You know, I've uh, I've got a couple of teenage sons, I need to clip around the ear every now and again to calm them down a little bit the same way, so I'd never do that, I'd never do that. But the same thing with the wine, you know, yeah. the younger vineyards need to be massaged a bit to soften things, just round them out. Once again, no oak tannins, the vats are so old, there's no oak tannins, it's right. just that gentle oxidative process. Oh, this, is, this is delicious, I love this, uh, I love this wine. Well, the great thing about, you know, unfortunately I've found with a lot of Australian wines, yeah. they tend to have got too big, too oaky, too ripe, too much American oak, which I must admit I hate, um, you know, using good wood or old wood. The wines about the fruit, you know, these are, dare I say, these are wines that represent Tawai. They don't represent the vessel they're aged in. I, I, I concur with you. I'm going to mention some competitors' names, and I don't think you're going to mind them. I'm because, them, but... well, because Australia does have that terroir. It was called Barossa. Barossa does have that terroir. Mm -hmm. And a couple of guys that have figured it out, other obviously than you, but is, is uh, Rocky O'Callaghan at Rockford mm -hmm. and Charles Melton. And those wines mm -hmm. are... With both gentlemen I work for. So. Exactly. So... That should hopefully tell our listeners and our sorry our viewers that these wines are wines of purity and authenticity, and, and that's what's for me in my shop really really important yeah. uh, to have and to offer my customers. Well, this is the future of what Australia, and this is this is Australian fine wine. You know, unfortunately, yeah. there's a lot of wines that have got very high reviews around the world, well actually not around the world in, in, in North America, that I don't think are fine wines. They're right. beverage wines. Don't confuse them. And the trouble is, because they've been touted as being fine wines. People will assume that all Australian fine wines, 15 and a half, 16 percent alcohol, full of American oak, overripe, and it lasts for five years and it turns into a slop. Right. And that's the problem. That's where we're doing the damage. Now we're seeing the result of that, and unfortunately, the, the image of Australian fine wines has taken a huge hit. It has taken a hit, and I can tell you, I went to a 50 year vertical of Wins Kunawara Cap, oh, okay. 55 to uh, uh, I think it was 2005. Obviously, not 50 different mm -hmm. vintages, but the highlights. Sure. Now, the 55 was drinkable, and here's what I loved about it. You probably spent 50 cents to a dollar 
when that wine came out in 1957. Um, and and it proved to me that Australia has the capability of making wines oh, of that age. And so, of course it did. And there's no added acid, no added tin, and there's no bullshit bills or whistle. Oh, absolutely. Absolute. It's very, very hard to convince people. Once they taste wines like this, I'm sure they'll figure it out. Anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, I don't know who our next guest is, but it's sure going to be someone that's uh, making some great wines, and hopefully it's controversial with Dave. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.